would, please remain standing in the reading of God's Word of the book of Colossians. And this morning we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. That's Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. You can find it in your pew Bibles at page 983. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And we were created, and, excuse me, and he is before all things, and in him all things were hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Thank you. You may be seated. When I first started seminary, the first class that I remember taking was uh, uh, Personal Evangelism 101. And in this class, they teach you how to share the gospel they tell you how you're supposed to do evangelism, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, when it comes to sharing your faith. And I remember at the beginning of this course, our professor asked us this question, who is Jesus Christ? And at first I thought, well, this is a silly question to ask a bunch of seminary students. I mean, at this point, if you're unable to share and tell who Christ is, you might want to reconsider your profession. But after we answered this question, he began to explain to us the reason why this question is so important when you share your faith with people. For you see, outside of these four walls, when you share and ask that question, who is Jesus Christ, you're going to get different responses from different people. For example, when you ask a Jehovah's Witness, who is Jesus Christ, they're going to tell you he is the angel Michael created by God. When you ask a Mormon who Jesus Christ is, they're going to tell you that he is the son of Elohim, the brother of Satan. When you ask a Muslim who Jesus Christ is, they're going to tell you that he was a prophet, but not God. When you ask a Hindu who Jesus Christ is, they're going to tell you that he is one of many gods, but not the God. And some people, when you ask this question, who is Jesus Christ, they're going to tell you that he was a, a good moral teacher, that he preached goodness and love and compassion, that, um, that he was someone who... Uh, lived a good, perfect life, but the whole God thing is just not out of the question. And there's some people, when you ask the question, who is Jesus Christ, they're going to tell you that he's a nobody. And I think even if you ask people in the church who Jesus Christ is, they're going to tell you different responses. Some are going to be very biblical. Some are going to be very shallow. Some are some responses you're going to wonder if they ever read the Bible at all. And there are some people who just could not explain or give an example of who Christ is. But after, what I want to do this morning is I want us to answer that question together, and I want us to look at God's Word as we ask that question, who is Jesus Christ? We have just spent the past couple of weeks looking at the birth of Christ, and in our minds we see Christ as the baby, but this morning I want us to, to think about who is it that we have just spent worshiping our, uh, for the past couple of weeks in the manger. So this morning, as we look at this question, who is Jesus Christ? Uh, hopefully we look at God's Word, well, we look at God's Word, and we'll answer this together. Fortunately for us, this is not a 21st century problem. Even Paul, during his day, was addressing this very question with the church in Colossians. And they were asked this very simple question, who is Jesus Christ? And Paul gives us four answers to this question this morning. So who is Jesus Christ? Who is this King that we worship? Number one, He is an eternal King. Look with me at verse, uh, the very first part of verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. God being invisible is a given throughout both the Old and New Testament. In fact, if you look at uh, 1 John verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made him know. And here Paul gives us this word image, and it's where we get the word icon. An icon is an exact replication. So you think about every day we see icons. You see icons on your computer. You see icons on your phone. Uh, especially if you have an icon for your iPhotos, you know that if you click on that on your phone, that you're going to see photos. You're not going to click on it 
and go to the internet, or you're not going to click on it, and it's going to go straight to your map. If your phone or computer is doing that, you have a problem. That's not what it's supposed to do. But when you see that icon, it is the exact replication. And God is the exact replica replication of, I mean, Christ is the exact replication of God. Christ is the one who makes the invisible God visible. And here, it's not just conveying the idea of seeing the image of God uh, as his body, but it's also conveying the idea that Christ is the exact replication on the inside. That God, in his mercy and goodness and love and justice, all those attributes we think of God, you can also find those things in Christ himself. Christ isn't half a God. Christ isn't a quarter of a God. Christ isn't one-eighth of a God. Christ is fully God. He's not God when, he wasn't God when he first came on this earth. He was God through eternal. So who is this king this morning? He is an eternal king. But not only is he an eternal king, he is a king over creation. Look with me in verse, the second part of verse 15 through 17. He is the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So here Paul gives us four different descriptions when it comes to Christ being the king over all of creation. And the first point he gives us is that he is the firstborn. And out of context, when you see this, this verse, you automatically think that, well, Christ must have been a created being by God. But that's not what Paul is telling us here. What Paul is telling us is that this is a term. Justin, I don't know how you do this, brother. i got to stop moving this morning. Um, that he is the firstborn. This term means that he is the first in rank over all of creation. And you find this term firstborn found in the rest, in other parts of the Old Testament. Israel was, was called the firstborn of nations. It doesn't mean that Israel was the first nation ever created. It just means on the totem pole, Israel was at the top. And here you have Christ, who's the firstborn of all creation. And so when you think about creation, you think of Christ being the very, very top. He is given this title. Out of all of the names in this world, he is at the very, very top. Not only is he at the top, but it also tells us that he is creator. Look at verse 16. It says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Here you see that Christ created creation. He is the agent of creation. And you think about how incredible the creative order is. You think about the universe and how vast the universe is. This week, or a couple weeks ago, I was reading an article about how I feel like we're always finding new planets and new stars in our galaxy. It just tells you how vast our universe is. In fact, they found a, a planet not too long ago that they think is just like Earth. It's only going to take us about a thousand years to get there, but they think it's just like Earth. And you think about how vast it is and all of the things that the universe holds, all of those things were created by Christ. And you think about our world, and you think about how beautiful and majesty our, our, majestic our world is. You think about the mountains that you have seen, or you think about the oceans that you have been on, or the beaches that you sit on. You think about the vast forest, you think about the jungle, you think about how incredible this world is. And all of those things our world uh, comprises of is made by Christ. And you also think about the creatures that live in our world, the, plant, the plants and the animals. I'm a geographic nerd. My wife gets annoyed by me. But the other day I watched this documentary where, did you realize that there are worms that live in glaciers? Isn't that cool? You might think, that's, that's, that's not cool at all. I think it's really cool. But those little glacier worms that live in these incredible temperatures were created by Christ. And then you think about the human body. You know, me and my wife are about to have our second child. And I remember seeing, like, when you go in the ultrasound, they have this chart that kind of gives you the progression of how a baby grows. Isn't it incredible that at the moment of conception, when those cells begin to form, that you find the complete DNA of a person at that very beginning stage? Isn't it incredible? And Christ created us. And then it also tells us not only does he create the things that we see, but he also creates the things that are invisible. And if you've got time sometime, go to Dr. Theerfielder. He will be more than happy to share with you about all those little microbes that are underneath your fingernail and how all those things underneath your fingernail were created by Christ. And so here, not only is Christ the creator of creation, but it also says that Christ is the creator of angels. Paul talks about this when he talks about 
uh, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all of those things are four classes of angelical power. So here you have Christ who created Michael, and he also created Lucifer. And so the things that we see and don't see, all the supernatural things that we see and we don't see in this world, Christ created them. And so when you begin to think about Christ, think about how he created creation, that as the creator, everything submits under his authority. Christ, he is creator. Not only is he the firstborn, he's the creator, but he's also the beginning and the end. Look with me at the last part of verse 16. It says, all things were created through him and for him. This is an incredible statement by Paul. He teaches that all things were created by him and towards him. Everything begins and ends with Christ. Through him points, as, points to Jesus as a mediator agent through whom God accomplishes his creative acts. For him points to Christ as the goal of creation. And what's the goal of creation? Christ restores creation to its intended state. See, before the fall took place, God's intention for creation was that it'd be perfect unity with God the Father. That was his intent at the very long that you and I and all of created order would be uh, unified with him. That's not the case. So he's the beginning and the end. Look at verse 17. He is the sustainer. Look what he says. And he's before all things. And in him all things hold together. The perfect tense here tells us that God is, Christ is continually holding things together. And you think about the fact that if he decided to kind of let everything go, our world, our universe, us included, would completely just fall apart. And so the Lord commands the sun to shine and the sun shines. The Lord commands the earth to spin and the earth spin. Christ commands the waves to move back and forth and the waves move back and forth. God, he holds together those little protons and neutron electrons that, that are the foundation block of, of everything we look around. He holds all of those things together. And since he holds all of those things together, don't you think that he can hold your life together too? Don't you believe if he can hold the world, the universe together, don't you think he can fix the problems that are in your life? Don't you think that he is a God who is capable of doing anything and everything? Christ not only created us, he sustains us. And we are made for him, not him for us. So, who is this king? He is an eternal king. He is a king who is over creation. But he is also a king above the church. Look with me in verse 18. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Just as Christ is sovereign over creation, Christ is also sovereign over the church. Christ is the brain of the church. He is head of the church. When I was growing up, I always heard that term, uh, people acting like the chicken with their head cut off. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm, um, nor did my family have to kill their food. But I remember as a young boy asking that question to one of my siblings, and they quickly responded, well, go look it up online, what that means. Um, after I looked it up online, I didn't eat chicken nuggets for several months. Um, but, but for those of you guys who, who know what I'm talking about, as soon as chicken gets its head cut off, it kind of just like goes crazy. It runs around, like it doesn't do anything, it just kind of like flops, it hops, it, it goes around in circles, sometimes it lies down, sometimes it gets back up, you're thinking, this thing is acting insane. And that is exactly what happens when Christ is not the head of a church. Things are chaotic. There's no purpose. Everything around us goes into kind of a frizzy. We, there, it goes up and down. There's nothing good that ever happens. But I am so thankful for First Baptist and the fact that we as a congregation place Christ so highly as the head of this church. I am so thankful that I get to work with um, some okay guys. Um, every week who desire and to see Christ to be the head of the church. I am so thankful for a worship service on Sunday and Wednesday nights that put Christ as the head of the church. I am so thankful for life groups 
and, and for Awana teachers and Wednesday night who work with students who put Christ ahead of the church. I am so thankful for missionary partners who desire for Christ to be the head of the church. I am so thankful for church members who desire in their families to see Christ ahead of the church. I am so thankful for single ladies and men who desired for Christ to be the head of the church. And once Christ is not the head of the church, all chaos takes place. But when it is, the church is alive. And here, Paul makes a point to tell us that Christ is the head of the church. And then he goes on to say that he is the firstborn of the dead. Again, this isn't saying that Christ was the, was the only person who was born from the dead. It just says that of all the people who have come back from the dead, Christ's death is of significance. Because you see, without the resurrection of Christ, there is no Christianity. Without the res- re- resurrection of Christ, there is no hope. Without the resurrection of Christ, you and I are doomed for an eternity. And praise be to God, Christ is the firstborn of the dead. And so who is this king? He is an eternal king. He is a king above creation. He is a king above the church, and he is a sacrificial king. Look with me at verses 19 through 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Here Paul takes us from creation to the cross. In verse 19, Christ fulfills the role of the temple in which we find the full presence of God. All the fullness dwells in Christ. Not partial, not a little. All the fullness of God dwells in Christ. So that in him universal reconciliation may be accomplished. In verse 20, the purpose of God's fullness in Christ is to reconcile the entire created realm to Christ. The act of reconciliation points to the restoration of this broken relationship. You see that at the very beginning, I told you that that the purpose that God had it for all of us and for all of creation was to be in unity with him. But because of Adam and Eve, sinning, sin caused a separation between us and God. And so it, throughout the Old Testament until even when Christ is birthed, God is, has, has, has desired for mankind to be in a relationship with him. And Christ is the mediator between us and God. Instead of the guilty party initiating the process of reconciliation, God, the offended party, took the initiative while we were still sinners. And he did this by making peace. Look what he says right there, making peace provides the means through which Christ's act of reconciliation was accomplished. The means through which such peace can be accomplished is the death of Christ himself. And how did he make peace? Oh, by the blood of the cross. Not just any cross, but his cross. Not to the cross to the left, not to the cross to the right, but his Christ, Christ's cross, made it possible so that you and I can have peace with God, so that we wouldn't have to feel the wrath of God. Christ made it possible so that we may be reconciled to God the Father. He brings the cosmic drama down to earthly plane, where a particularly shameful death accomplished that which we have cosmic, cosmic significance. So who is this king? He is an eternal king. He is a king above, a king over creation. He is a king above the church. He is a sacrificial king. So I ask the question again, who is Jesus Christ? And for some of us, for some of us, we don't see Christ this way at all. We don't see him as eternal. We don't see him as creator. We don't see him as the head of the church. We don't see him as a sacrifice. Instead, some of us today see Christ as a handyman, seen as a source of quick fixes to deal with the problems by providing instant solutions on command. Thanks, Jesus, for coming to my life. I've got this problem, but you fixed it now. See you later. I'll see you next time. I'll call and let a friend know about how good your service has been. For some of us, when we see Christ today, we see him as an interior decorator, contracted to enhance church activities, giving them that extra something. All right, God, I'm ready for Sunday. I'm ready for you to make me feel real good this morning. I'm ready to worship, God. I'm ready to have this kind of come to Jesus moment, and then afterwards, 
I'm gone, I'll just tweet or hashtag, got my Jesus on today at First Baptist. Maybe for you, you see Christ as an EMT, emergency medical technician, ready to be brought in quickly at those points where believers finally have exhausted their own uh, ingenuity, ingenu, ingenu, excuse me, resources. There we go. You get tongue-tied after the end of the sermon right here. You got thirsty. Who's, who has all your resources gone, and then all of a sudden you're like, all right, God, you come in and just do your thing. Or maybe for you, he's a personal trainer, kept on retainer, the way that one depends on a golf coach to provide practical pointers in order to play the game of life a little more successful. Maybe for you, Jesus Christ is a pharmacist, ready to dispense self-discovery, putting healing palms on hurting hearts, or prescribing pills for the suffering life thrown at Christians. Listen, church, there is no other version of Jesus Christ here. Only Christ's preeminent kingship. There is no other Jesus. So he must be first in everything that we do in life. He has to be first in our families. Moms, dads, is Christ first in your families? Do you get excited about Jesus as much as you get excited about watching football or basketball? Do your kids know the priority that is in your home? When it comes to extracurricular activities, when it comes to schools, when it comes to traveling leagues, is Christ first in your home? What about in your marriage? Is Christ first in your marriage? Men, are you leading in a way where Christ is first? Ladies, are you leading in a way where Christ is first in your marriage? What about your profession? Is Christ first in your profession? Do your coworkers know that you love Jesus more than you do life itself? Do you treat your employees like Christ would treat his employees? Are you a good worker where your boss knows who Christ is? Do you teach in such a way where your students know the glory and the majesty of God? What about when it comes to missions and ministry? Is Christ first? Is Christ first in the matters of intellect? Is Christ first in your time? Is Christ first in your love? Is Christ first when it comes to the conversations you have with your friends and families and peers? Is Christ first when it comes to the pleasures of life? Is Christ first when it comes to eating? Is Christ first when it comes to play? Is Christ first when it comes to your athletics? Is Christ first when it comes to your school? Is Christ first in what you watch? Is Christ first in how you worship? Let us give him first place in all that we do this year. And maybe this morning for you, maybe you, when it comes to the question, who is Jesus Christ, you don't know him. In fact, he's more of a stranger than you than anything else. Maybe for some of you this morning, I know it seems like a very simple question, but maybe this morning for you, some of you just need to just reflect on who God is in your life and know that he's, he's there for you. Know that he is a God who's in control. Maybe for us as a church, we need to just continue to put Christ first above all things that we do. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Father God, I thank you for how your word teaches us who you are. That you, God, are eternal. That you are a God of who is over creation. You are a God who holds things together, Father, that you are a God who is in charge of this church. And Father, you are a God who took the initiative and made a way for us. Father, I pray for those who have yet to put their trust in you this morning, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, I pray for those who have, 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 have left you. It may be the day that they be challenged to return back to you. Father, maybe today just be a day where we just worship you and thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.